month. She joins me now in the studio, Toronto's own Rupi Kaur. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Here's what I don't understand. So you, you have this huge success with Milk and Honey, mm -hmm. right? You have uh, you self-publish it, right? It sells two million. Um, it, it becomes this, this worldwide phenomenon. People are talking about how they've never seen a Canadian writer have a, a, an impact globally the way you have. And then in the middle of just kind of dealing with all this, mm. you have to write another collection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean it was awful? I mean, I was like, life was changing so quickly. Yeah. And I had no idea what the hell was going on. But also, throughout the entire time, I thought I did. I had it all figured out, and I was <laughs> under control. I was like, you are under control. You know what's happening right now. Yeah. But only in hindsight do I realize, oh, no. Like, I was losing my mind, sort of. And then in the middle of it, you know, we signed a book deal, and I had to meet a deadline. Oh, man. And so then off I went. And for many months it was like a lot of pressure and I felt debilitated like my hands were tied behind my back and I was told to write mm -hmm. but nothing came out and like weeks and weeks would pass but it was because of the you know I felt like I needed to create something that would be quote-unquote as successful as milk and honey and so going into it like that I thought was um that was difficult, but as soon as I got rid of that, and I was like, "No, like you just have to write what you love." How do you do that? Like, what was the was there a moment that changed everything? Yeah, I mean, I was I would show up at my table every day. I would start writing. You write it at your kitchen table, or a... yeah, kitchen table, living room, that sort of thing. Right. And I would like it was like that typical thing where you would just like literally rip your paper out of your notebook and like toss it away. And I was like, "No, this isn't the way to do it. I'm not writing a book." Mm -hmm. I'm just writing a page a day. And when I framed it like that, it got easier. Mm -hmm. And so eventually a page a day, a page a day, a page a day turned to like 200 pages. And then we had a book. And I realized that's how Milk and Honey was born, you know. The yeah, book you, you was did... a side effect of everything else I was doing. Yeah, you weren't you weren't writing a book when you were writing Milk and Honey. No. You were just writing for you. Yeah, exactly. I want to play some poetry for you right now. Not your poetry, okay. uh, but this is poetry that has inspired you the way your poetry has inspired a lot of people. Um, this is one of your favorites. This is Maya Angelou reciting Still I Rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust. I'll arise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Just because I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like suns and like moons with the certainty of tides. Just like hope springing high. Still I rise. My Angelou reciting Still I Rise, a poem that inspired my guest Ruby Kaur. How? What, what do you hear when you listen to that? I feel powerful, and there are very few poems growing up that I read that made me feel powerful and like I could get up and change the world, and Maya Angelou was one of those poets that made me feel like that every day. Okay, so now you have people showing up to your readings with tattoos of your poetry on their arm, um, saying that your poetry changed their lives in the same way that Maya Angelou changed yours. So how does that feel? Overwhelming. Yeah? I mean... It's not something that, like, you're saying that and that's so wicked, but I think it's still like, <laughs> oh, really? What? And that, like, a couple, I think it was Friday, we were filming something for um, BBC, actually, and we were in a parking garage, we parked my car, we're trying to go through um, the subway station up to Eaton Center, and I didn't even make it. There was young women coming up to me, and they were like, oh, my God, how's it going? And they were saying all the wonderful things you said, and I think it just hit me right in the face and suddenly I'm crying and they're crying and we're all crying and I was like I need to get out of here is it this, this scary no it's beautiful it's beautiful because it's like they feel like they're being held but in that love and in that support that they're giving me I feel like I am and it gives me strength to you know continue to write and continue to share because you know, some, there are some days, lots of days, actually, when you wake up and you're like, what am I doing? Like, oh, is yeah. this, you know, is this worth it? Why am I sharing with so many people? I feel naked. But then you have these folks come up to you and you realize that if your work or anything you say can just connect and help one person, like, that's enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and on Instagram, I mean, everything you put up has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of likes and, and yeah. comments. How, I mean, how are you able to manage that? Or do you just turn your, no your notifications yeah, off? Yeah, I just turn them off. And I feel like for me, it's like everything that happens on the phone is so, like, 
Yeah, like it's happening, but is it really happening? Yeah, it's kind of like watching TV. And yeah, thing. and that's why I'm like, oh, it just kind of like flies over my head. But do you, do you ever worry that your your life isn't yours anymore? It now belongs to the people who who read you, the people who no. believe in what you're doing. No, I think like I don't know. I think my readers make me feel like um, we're kind of like just sitting around a round table, and we're just together. We're listening and we're understanding and speaking to one another. With all this attention, with all the success, there has been a certain backlash. The Guardian and New York Magazine have written about the backlash to your work, people saying it's so-called not uh, not so-called real literature. But I read this BuzzFeed piece that was like 3,000 words called The Problem with Rupi Kaur's Poetry. Where's where's all this coming from? I have no idea. Is that true? I don't read it. Of course. Why? Why would you read it? Yeah. So um, I think it's natural and it's bound to happen. What is backlash and controversy or whatever it is when you get successful the way you have exactly especially in a new medium yeah Yeah. and i think it was very difficult at first because i was like oh my goodness like i'm not trying to do anything i'm not trying to hurt anybody so why are these people trying to hurt me you know what i mean and but now i'm like oh wait like this is bound to happen like when you're you know also given so much love and you're given so much support there's always going to be people that are like we don't get this and we're going to dismantle it do your friend do your friends like send you the Links no, or like that. they used to, and then I was like, "What are you doing? <laughs> are you my friend? I don't want to see this. I don't want to talk about it." So they don't, t- they don't send it anymore. But here's the thing: how much of this backlash? Let's be honest here, yeah. is about that your readers, the people who buy your books, the people who read your poetry on Instagram, mm-hmm. are largely young and largely women. Hmm. I think that's like that's what's I think offensive. It's like. You can say what you want about me or my work and all of that kind of stuff, but you're now dismantling the millions of people who have purchased this book and seek solace and, you know, pick it up each day or have it next to their bedstand. You're belittling their healing and their intelligence level and all of those things. And I think I think that's unfair. And I think when you, I mean, I shouldn't be saying this, but like when you when you put your poetry up on Instagram, that's mm-hmm. something that a lot of people haven't really ever seen before and getting mm-hmm. a lot of success on Instagram. New, exactly. new things are, yeah. are, are bound to be. It's like very traditional media, which is poetry, meeting something very untraditional. And the gatekeepers of both don't understand what's going on because, you know, I've kind of like married these two things along with lots of other writers also using Instagram to, you know, share their work. So I think it's like a very interesting time. Well, let's do some real old media right now. Yeah. Let's let's uh, can you read some poetry for yeah. us? What are you, you going to read? I'm going to read. It's one of my favorite pieces. It's called Timeless. Like okay, you set set it up for us. If, if people are listening to this, so they're not they're not on the Instagram. This is the first time yeah. it's called it the Instagram. They're not on the Instagram. This is the first <laughs> time they're hearing you. So set this up for us. Timeless. They convinced me I only had a few good years left before I was replaced by a girl younger than me. As though men yield power with age, but women grow into irrelevance. They can keep their lies, for I have just gotten started. I feel as though I just left the womb. My twenties are the warm-up for what I'm really about to do. Wait till you see me in my thirties. Now that will be a proper introduction to the nasty, wild woman in me. How can I leave before the party started? Rehearsals begin at 40. I ripen with age. I do not come with an expiration day. And now, for the main event, curtains up at 50. Let's begin the show. That's Ruby Kaur, the best-selling poet behind Milk and Honey and The Sun and Her Flowers, reading from her latest collection, The Sun and Her Flowers. That was timeless. So t- tell me about that poem. Where, where were you when you wrote it? What, what, what inspired that poem? <laughs> uh, I t- decided that I could not write anymore, and this is like sometime around 2015. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to take a little bit of a break. You're going to retire. I'm going to retire for like six months <laughs> right. and, you know, put this thing away. I'm tired right now. And this was actually right after Milk and Honey was picked up by publishers, and it was like all bookstores everywhere and like things are just going crazy at the moment and for like a couple weeks everybody was okay with it and then slowly a couple months later you know I had like publishers and agents and just people in my life that were like what are you doing you know 
somebody's going to come along and they're going to quote unquote replace you. If you don't sign this book deal or if you don't do this or if you don't do that, you know, there's going to be another young poet, like all of these kind of very negative and toxic ideas they were putting in my mind, um, not purposefully, but it's just the world we live in, I guess, um, that there's only space for one woman or a few women. And if you don't take up that space right now, that there just won't be no space for you. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, like this is, this is insane. And it makes no sense because why does my lifespan have to be so short? my lifetime span for success. Whereas, you know, I see men and they're like in their seventies and they're at their like prime and their peak. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I need to take my time and I need to give myself the space. And that's when Timeless was born. And I also was at this event where I met a group of women who were in their fifties and sixties in that same week. And they were like, uh, just so happy. And so like, you know, you know, like usually I'd heard like, you know, life, after like 40, like what, what is there? And these women were like, oh my God, life starts at 50. You mm -hmm. are going to have the best time of your life. Yeah. Like, let me tell you. And I was like, whoa, you are changing my entire lens here. And I went home and I wrote Timeless. These people in their 50s and 60s, though, they're, they're used to reading poetry in like po poetry collections. <laughs> yeah. you know? I mean, do you, do you think we read poems differently on Instagram than we do in a book? Um, I'm not sure. I think, I think they're... I think we have, the medium is different, so we must. And I think about it myself as somebody who, as a designer, for example, like I design the sun and her flowers from front to back. And so I'm very careful in terms of what poem goes next to what poem yeah. and how the chapters are organized because I want to create a certain universe and reader experience for my readers. Um, but I can't do that on Instagram. But, but also in your, in your book, when I, when I pick up your book to read it, mm -hmm. um, I know what I'm doing. I'm picking up Ruby Core's book. I'm going to read Ruby Core's book now for 10, 15 minutes, right? Yeah. When I'm on Instagram, I might be looking at a picture of someone I went to high school with and yes. then a picture of a dog yeah. and then a meme and then a, a beautiful poem. Like the context is different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think it makes um, – I think maybe why it worked on Instagram, although I – when I first started in 2013, I did not think it would, um, is because – you're on when you're on the internet it's an interesting thing cuz you're so connected but you also feel so disconnected from quote unquote real life but when you read poetry and when you experience art you're suddenly connected to yourself again so you know you're scrolling through you're reading this meme or you're seeing this meme and you're doing all the things and then all of a sudden this poem is there and it's like holding a mirror up and seeing yourself mm -hmm. and i think that's probably that's my guess as to why it hit off on instagram so well so how are you doing now? I mean, you, you write how this has been one of the greatest and most difficult years of your life. And I yeah. think like throughout our conversation today, you've been saying things like, this is incredible, this is the greatest, and also yeah. like, I have to stop writing sometimes. Yeah. I don't know how this is going to go. Uh, and you close The Sun and Her Flowers, your, yeah. your, your collection, by talking about how there are days when breathing feels exhausting and mm. you still need to find your own sun, grow your own flowers. Mm. Ruby Core, do you still feel that way? No, I think life is like being on a Ferris wheel. And so when I was writing that piece, the Ferris wheel was, you know, it was on its way down. And right now the Ferris wheel is on its way up and I am just all smiles and it's incredible. But like it's, everything is in balance and, you know, in a couple months or maybe in a couple, I don't know when, but it'll be on its way down again and then up and down. And so you just have to like let that happen and live through. Well, because it, it, it's about. Well, that, that takes a certain mindfulness, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it takes a certain sense of self. And one other thing is that when you publish your poetry on Instagram in a way that perhaps poets in the past weren't able to, to get is you get this instant feedback. And if you yes. look at the comments on your Instagram mm -hmm. poems, there, or just your poems that are on yeah. Instagram, I don't want to diminish them. Yeah. Like um, you get all these comments, love you, love you, Ruby. This is mm -hmm. the greatest. You are the greatest and this greatest. Mm -hmm. Like how do, you, how do you manage to find yourself through all that noise? Um, I don't. Read comments? Really? Yeah. You don't even feel the temptation to say, oh, what, what, what are they no, saying? No, I used to. Now I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> Why not? Why don't you read comments? Because I don't want, I know where the magic comes from. The magic comes from me being honest with myself. And maybe I'm afraid that if I read comments, I'm going to let external things influence my writing and change my mind. So like, for example, I might want to write about something, but if I read a comment or like a couple comments about, 
you know, what other people want me to write, then I might not want to write the thing that I actually want to write about. And so I just want to, I, yeah, I don't want to, you know what I mean? Get influenced. And you want to, but like, how do you, how do you tune out all that, all that praise too? Or do you? No, I don't tune it out. I used to, but yeah. now I'm like, give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I am learning to accept and learning to give back and learning to accept and be grateful. It's it's a really beautiful collection. Thank you. And I, I love your Instagram feed. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Ruby Core, thanks a lot for coming in. <laughs> Thank you. Ruby Core is the best selling poet and author of Milk and Honey. Her latest collection, The Sun and Her Flowers, is out now.